Hastings has a newly upgraded four lane all tide boat ramp. It has a queuing pontoon but only on the north side and shallow water outside all the markets. It's a busy ramp but if you aim to launch or retrieve between 9.30 and 10.30am you will usually find it a bit quieter. Leaving Hastings there is a couple of miles of well marked channel to negotiate. With five days on the water this trip, the aim is to sail around French Island exploring some of its anchorages and then to visit Observation Point on Phillip Island to see its suitability for drying out a trailer sailor. The passage known as the Cut provides a short cross across to Fairhaven Beach. Jetty ruins on the beach mark Fairhaven's location. Like so many anchorages, Fairhaven is tide dependent and we were too late to dry out on the firmer sand close to the shore. Instead we elected to anchor in the shallows where the boat would settle onto the weed and mud bottom between tides. Fairhaven has many kilometres of beach and walking trails for long walks ashore. I've got to say I'm really a convert for these electric mo outboard motors now uh, for the dinghy to go ashore. Uh, fantastic little units. This is only a cheap AD Bay one and uh, being run by a 100 amp hour lithium battery. Um, but basically, uh, on full power, we do about five knots, which is more than adequate for going around anchorages and going ashore and all the rest. And I have solar panels on the boat to recharge them all. A few miles to the north is Red Bill Creek. We anchor in a metre of water outside the Red Bill Creek with the tide falling rapidly. We take the dinghy and explore the inlet. The inlet provides excellent shelter for a trailer sailor in all weather which could enter on a half tide or greater past the first bend. Above half tide the inlet also provides access past the shore mangroves onto the island itself.
Heading north again, we head for Crawfish Rock on the northwest tip of French Island. The channel alongside the rock is subject to strong tidal flows and turbulence. Negotiating the inside channel is best done in the last hour before low tide. This way the sides of the channel can be seen and the passage can be kept into the deeper water. So once the tide slackened we uh, changed over to the new electric motor. Um, it pushes the boat on about 2.8, 2.9 knots. Uh, so once the tide slackened off a bit so it didn't have to push too hard against the tide. Uh, it's a nice relief because it's a nice quiet way to be pushed along if there's no wind. The solar charger that uh, controls the charge to the uh, electric motor battery um, is quite convenient in that the uh, little LED on the left hand side there starts to go to orange when the battery is nearing flat. Um, you know, and on half power the motor actually lasts uh, you know, up to five hours uh, on the 150 amp hour battery I've got. Um, it's always hard to tell because the solar panels are constantly putting extra charge in there, so you know, it's a great system. And this is what you call a Western Port glass out. Absolutely flat as a tabletop. There's a tiniest bit of breeze blowing, but uh, other than that, you've not a ripple on the water. Uh, and you can see the sides of the channel as the channel gets narrower and narrower as we're heading towards the northeast uh, tip of um, French Island. Once at the end of the navigable water, I anchor Naringa for the night, a mile or so off Palmer's Point. The tides to cross the hump ahead will only be right the next morning. The hump, it's now fully underwater. Um, it should be about 1.5 metres deep at the shallowest, so we're going to have a go at crossing around the hump now, around the northeast corner of French Island. The charts indicate the hump dries to 1.2 metres, and today's tide is 2.7, giving us around 1.5 metres of depth. And in ideal conditions, the electric's pushing the boat on at 3 knots at the moment. That's the top reading on the uh, metre there. A lot of the northeastern corner of French Island is lined by thick mangroves, which slowly give way to sandy and rocky shorelines as you move further south. The southeastern corner of the island has a long sand spit that is in the right tides and conditions would provide a great drying out location. The pass between Snapper Rock and Pelican Island is subject to strong tidal rips and turbulence. The roughest water was actually found at the edges of the deeper water. The southern shores of French Island are marked by stretches of rock or sand bordering rolling farmland. With a freshening sea breeze, Naringa takes off towards Phillip Island.
Observation point is a sandy point on the edge of the inlet called the nits. Drying out is possible within the inlet behind the point with protection from all but easterly quarter winds. At high tide, most of the extensive sand spit is underwater. Drying out is best done south of the vegetated point. Without enough tide to stay at observation point, we moved up the coast of Phillip Island towards Cowes and anchored off the beach for the night. With strong northerlies in the forecast, we headed over towards Tortoise Head on French Island to investigate the bay to the east as an anchorage. So a good drying out spot for northerly winds uh, is just in here to the east of Tortoise Head uh, on French Island. And if you line up, put, drop your anchor out near the white pole which is on the outside of the, uh, the channel that you come in on. And you line up with the mangroves that are on the shore. Um, and then drop a stern anchor, uh, reverse in until you're in nice shallow water as the tide's dropping and then put a stern anchor out and tighten up between the two and you'll dry out beautifully here. The drying out legs and the bottom of the boat have now both settled onto the bottom uh, and the drying out legs are providing the stability required to stop the boat from tipping. The drying out legs attach to specially strengthened gunnels on the hull with the angle held by attachments to the bottom of the stanchion. Removable plates are attached before deploying the legs to spread the load onto the bottom. The area abounds with bird life of all types. The shoreline is rocky to the west, ending in mangroves and the remains of an old slipway. To the east, several miles of sandy beach make for interesting walks with birds, an old slipway and other relics to be found.
After the northerlies moderate, we set off for cows to shelter from the strong southwesterly change predicted for midnight the following night. So this is the wind vane in action and only six knots of wind. Uh, you notice the uh, triangular block at the front of the rudder. That is the uh, wedge that I used to rotate the rudder's blade forward at the bottom and back at the top, which balances the rudder and makes it a lot easier for the wind vane system to steer. It's struggling a bit in six knots, but before it wouldn't, do, it wouldn't steer in six knots at all, so I'm actually quite pleased with the result. And that's the wind vane up top there. Um, responding to very very light breezes but like I say uh, six knots is about its limit before it couldn't do it and now with the balanced rudder it is now actually steering a reasonable course. With the tide at its lowest point we bypass Sandy Point this time on our way to Cows. We take one of the four public moorings to the west of the Cow's Jetty for a very rolly night. With our time over, in the morning we head back for Hastings. Sandy Point is an excellent drying anchorage in winds from south around to west. Greater than half tide is required for entry and exit. The historic 2000 tonne HMAS Atama submarine awaits an uncertain fate. Some would like to make her a shore based museum but this was rejected by the council. She was even off for sale several years ago on eBay but didn't sell for the asking price of $4.9 million.